Hello and welcome to um, St Peter's Basilica, which is my backdrop uh, for this video. I wanted to do something really about the ongoing story of Bishop Strickland as it unfolds before us. Um, and I have to say, <clears throat> I said in previous videos, you know, Bishop Strickland came to my attention really, really early on in um, this papacy because he was an outspoken advocate for the gospel. That's really, that's that, not because he was a critic of anyone or because of any sort of arguments that he got involved or polemics, but basically because um, what he, it was fairly obvious that what he was saying was the gospel truth. So um, since he's been um, removed, I've noticed that there's been some really sad attempts from lots of people who are supporters of Pope Francis, um, more extreme sort of vision for the church. And they're trying to, now they're trying to smear Bishop Strickland, which I think is a really, you know, it's absolutely a, a terrible thing to be doing. Um, and such a shame because he really does seem to be such a gentle and um, obvious advocate for the gospel. So I thought we'd go through a few things today and see if we can have a look at some of the things that have been say, being said so here we've got, this is um, Where Peter Is, um, which is a website run by this guy, Mike Lewis. Um, and it's one of the most vocal supporters of Pope Francis. And, um, you know, I've, I've interacted with Mike a number of times and I've got a lot of respect for the fact that he is in this position where he is trying to defend the Pope. But as the Pope's actions become increasingly um, radical so does the defense you know the attempt to defense and um, as a faithful Catholic obviously I've always been faithful to the teaching of the Pope but that's been because the teaching of the Pope has been to explain the teachings of Jesus and the Apostles and so that's and that is the role of the Pope um, as a focal point of unity so at the point where um, the Pope says things which appear to be a little bit at odds with, with the gospel. That's where, I, you know, I kind of feel that it's reasonable for us to call him out. Um, not so much Mike, who said that if uh, a more orthodox Pope was elected next to, took, you know, went back to sort of the hermeneutic of continuity, Pope Benedict's um, direction, then he would stop writing um where Peter is and go and do something else. Anyway, I don't want to have a gut Mike because I've got a lot of respect for him, for the um, the effort that he puts in. But I, I just wanted to run through this and, and have a little um, analysis of what's going on here. So, um, you know, <clears throat> he starts off with saying that a lot of people are asking about the, the justification. And this really is uh, an attempt to say that the removal of Strickland is justified. And Mike gives, starts off by giving us some examples of people, really high profile Catholics who have been asking um, why there is no justification. Um, for example, EWTM Rome correspondent, Joan Lewis, who said how very sad, the sad fact is that no reason was given, no transparency, we need a reason. Father Gerald Murray, who is uh, another EWTN presenter, he's a, uh, well-known priest and a canon lawyer. And he told the Washington Post, I know of no canonical crime that he's accused of having committed that would deserve the punishment of removal. Um, and in that same post in the Washington Post, Father Murray also said, Pope Francis has not told us why he did this. So no one can come to a clear judgment as to whether this action was fair or not. The Holy See's omission of stating the reason for removal calls into the question the canonical integrity of the process. Um, the traditionalist website One Peter Five took to their Twitter account to express the approval, their disapproval, posting no reason given except the will of the Pope. This is the definition of arbitrary power. So Mike says he's seen scores of comments to this effect, and Strickland has himself suggested several times that he doesn't know the reason for his for his ouster. That's what he actually writes. 
now Sting, I suppose is what it means. He told John Henry Weston in a 30 minute interview given hours after his removal, the only answer I have is because forces in the church right now don't want the truth of the gospel. It continued, they want it changed and they want it ignored. They want to be rid of the truth that is gloriously not going to go away. The truth that is Jesus Christ, his mystical body, which is the church, all the wonders that the martyrs died for and the saints lived for through almost 2000 years since Christ died and rose. I love that. I love what he said there. I think it's brilliant. Okay, mixed signals. So many seem to be under the impression that Strickland was given no explanation for his removal. A narrative has emerged that he was simply kicked out because he's some sort of courageous defender of the truth against Pope Francis' program of undermining the deposit of faith. A Catholic news agency story by Jonathan Liddell noted that Strickland's 30 minute media appearance did not answer several key unknowns in the Strickland saga such as what the Vatican stated reasons, if any, were given for the dramatic step. Bishop Strickland's first public statement to the media following remo removal suggests that Strickland is likely aware of the official reasons for his dismissal. Um, Strickland said, I stand by all the things that were listed as complaints against me. I didn't implement traditionis custodes, which is the, the decree about banning the Latin mass and because I can't starve out part of my flock. I do it the same way. I feel very much at peace with the Lord and the truth that he died for. Is what Strickland said. So, you know, <laughs> I thought that was really good as well. The implication of this statement is that the bishop was indeed given a number of listed problems with his governance, but that he stands by his actions nevertheless. Among these problems, apparently, is his unwillingness to implement traditionis custodis. Now, Mike is a real advocate for traditionis custodis, since that was issued, he sort of moved his whole um, every like his whole argument against traditional Catholicism, which is a real shame because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and Catholics. I think you know the word Catholic comes from the Greek Catholicos, which means universal, and that means that one of the great things is the unity that we have in diversity, and it seems like a real shame to me that Pope Francis has decided to pick on particular aspects of the faith and to attack those people. Um, Strickland issued a statement on the 30th of July 2021 that said, I'm not ready to issue permanent norms for the diocese at this time. And, since, and basically just didn't do anything from, from there on. Um, Strickland indicated that he was going to give many reasons for his, that he was given many reasons for his removal and shared what seems to be a second example from the list. He said, I was given by the nuncio quite a list of reasons. One of the reasons was that I failed to be supportive of the synod on synodality. His answers have lacked consistency. Um, when he was asked by the National Catholic Reporter in Baltimore whether he had been given a reason for his dismissal, he responded, not officially. The letter's online, I think, available. I mean, it's from the Vatican. That's really all I received as well as Friday afternoon. Uh, an article on Monday of our Sunday Visitor News explained that Strickland's removal was an administrative rather than penal action. This means that the official reason for the decision was not a canonical crime. Even though Strickland has been long criticised by Catholics for many words and actions that could potentially warrant ecclesial discipline. Has he? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I know that there are some, um, I know that there are some people criticising him. Um, but I didn't know that there is a long list. Um, I can give you, I can certainly give you an example. And really, they're all the sort of the the usual suspects. And here we've got the Vatican correspondent, Christopher Lamb, um, who's the Vatican correspondent for the tablet we focused before. And, you know, he's supposed to be given an objective position on the news. And here he says, so he's, he's posted the bulletino there from, from Rome, and he says, Pope Francis removed Bishop Street from the leadership of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. The move comes after an investigation which is understood to have found problems with his governance of the diocese, including a breakdown in relationships with priests and local bishops. He's also accused Pope Francis of undermining the deposit of faith and has, his, and has questioned Francis' legitimacy. Okay, so how much of this do you think is true and how much is false? What I thought I'd do is um, 
Bishop Strickland has given a, a he's given a couple of interviews, and probably the best one um, is from EWTN. So he did an interview. I think it was only yesterday with Raymond Royo, Raymond Arroyo from um, the World Over, and I've got that up here. So let me just share it with you, and perhaps we can. I'm pretty sure I've tested it, so you should be able to listen in as well to what's going on. So um, let's have a listen. And this is this is the interview. We'll stop it and go through some of the things as we go along. Being a specific reason for the move, needless to say, a worldwide firestorm of controversy has erupted. Here to respond to the Vatican's decision and action here, I'm joined by His Excellency Bishop Joseph Strickland. He joins us from Baltimore. Bishop Strickland, thank you for being here. Despite... So if you don't know, it's the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops annual meeting in Baltimore at the moment. And um, they're, so all the bishops get together and they've got numerous things to discuss. Um, the pillar has been reporting really thoroughly on this. If you want to pop over there and have a look at, at what they're actually talking about. Um, but Bishop Strickland, who is still a bishop, he hasn't been removed from the episcopacy, obviously, um, was asked not to go to that meeting, which I just find so heartbreaking. Um, so, but he'd arranged to meet with groups of lay people for prayer. So um, he did go over there and um, he was out there basically um, praying the rosary outside, etc. So that's the context for this now. That's why Bishop Strickland is in Baltimore. The recent apostolic visitation of your former diocese ordered by Pope Francis and completed in June. This news of your removal has come as a shock to Catholics. This was the terse statement from the Holy See. We'll put it on the screen. The Holy Father has removed Bishop Joseph E. Strickland from the pastoral care of the Diocese of Tyler, United States of America, and has appointed Bishop Joe Vasquez of Austin, his apostolic administrator. Um, Bishop, th that was the bulletin from the Holy See Press Office. Uh, my question is this. No reason was given in the bulletin, and no official reason for your dismissal has been offered since. Did you have any idea that this was coming before you read the bulletin, and were you personally notified about this, and how? Yes, uh, Raymond, I had a uh, in-person visit in the nuncio's office of uh, the nunciature last Thursday. Um, and we had a brief meeting where uh, his eminence informed me of uh, really the, the Holy Father's decision. At first, they said, we're, uh, we're requesting that you resign. And I'd made it pretty very public that I, I felt I couldn't resign. So they simply said, well, then you will be uh, removed. Uh, the letter that I was sent actually said I was relieved of the responsibilities as Bishop of Tyler, um, an interesting mm. word. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. and I actually didn't see the, the statement in the bulletin, you know, that comes out at noon on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, but that I was informed uh, in the meeting, in person on Thursday, very cordial. Um, his eminence was, you know, I, it seemed almost uh, kind of embarrassed to, to share this, but I, I said, I understand. I know it's part of your work uh, to mm -hmm. deliver this kind of message. And uh, so I was informed on Thursday morning, flew back to Dallas and then Tyler, uh, drove to Tyler, and got, I was back in the office, had masses as usual. Of course, I didn't tell anyone anything. And then I received the, um, by email, an attachment of the letter that said I was relieved of my duties uh, was of, that, as Bishop was, of was Tyler. Was that the papal decree? Was that the, the papal decree that they sent you? Well, yes, yes, yeah. And it, it mm -hmm. gave, it was, Pretty much what you said on the bulletin said, I'm removed. Bishop Vovas Joe Vasquez of the Diocese of Austin has been appointed as administrator as they await the naming of the fifth Bishop of Tyler. Did <clears throat> Cardinal Pierre offer any reason for the request for you to retire? Um, yes, he read, 
read several pages of issues that of concerns and really uh, he made it clear that the decisions made he was just sort of giving me information about what the decision was based on um, and it was that let me say because there's a lot out there because of some yes. comments even from a priest in the diocese oh administrative mm -hmm. concerns he didn't mention a single okay so this bit is really interesting this uh priest in the diocese bit now if you wanted to know more about that i think that this is basically about a priest who was in ireland and i think he was a bit of a problem in ireland and then he was moved out um like out of all places to tyler texas so if you wanted to know more about that i'm not gonna i'm not gonna play it all but um i'll just give you an idea of um, this is my friend Robert Nugent, so you can see his channel is De Creevy. Um and this is a great video, Liberal Irish Lobby with the day, win the day in getting Bishop Strickland removed. So he's saying that basically that there was an intervention by the progressive, by progressive clergy from Ireland um, who, who have attacked Bishop Strickland because they didn't like basically what he was saying. Now, Bishop Strickland explains a little bit about that here, um, but there's also, interestingly, a news report. Um, let me see if I can pull that up for you. Uh, and it, it's got this, well, maybe it's one of a number of priests or, um, you know, maybe this is the particular priest. So uh, let's have a little... Let's have a little watch of this and you get the idea of what the opposition is like. Tonight with a story that is making headlines all around the world, Pope Francis ordering the removal of Bishop Joseph Strickland, the leader of the Catholic Diocese of Tyler. Strickland, an outspoken conservative, has been a frequent critic of Pope Francis and his priorities. Most recently, Strickland criticized Pope Francis's closed door debate on making the Catholic Church more welcoming. Topics included women in governance roles and welcoming LGBT Catholics. Strickland called it a, quote, travesty that those topics were even on the table for discussion. Today, we spoke with Father Tim Kelly of Holy Spirit Church in Holly Lake Ranch, who has previously called for Strickland's resignation. The issue here is not about Tim Kelly or Joe Strickland. The issue here is about we're Roman Catholics. A Catholic never, ever, ever speaks ill of the Pope in public. You can say what you want over a cup of coffee, but a priest or a lay person, the Pope is not Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whatever. The Pope is a sacred person chosen by the Cardinals to succeed to the throne of St. Peter. It'd be interesting to see if this guy felt the same about Pope Benedict XVI or Pope John Paul II. Um, but I would, I would say, particularly when you've got a Pope who is like, I mean, what's the most recent thing is the bishop in Sicily that he's covered up for, who, you know, is part of an ongoing trial for covering up abuse. You've got Zan uh, Bishop Zanchetto, who's in prison, who is one of the Pope's best friends, who was made a bishop by the Pope and um, was then promoted when he, you know, when, he, when his trial started in Argentina, he was moved to the Vatican and the Pope found a nice little job for him. You've got um, the embezzlement of the Vatican Bank. You've got the problems with um, the undermining of the underground church in China. Are you seriously saying that we're just, what are we supposed to just go along with these things? I'm afraid, you know, we're at the point where it diverges from the faith. You, I, I, can't, I can't say that I'm on side with all of that stuff. Um, you've, got to, you've got to do your best to sort of look on the potential bright sides of it, but you know, I think things like Pachamama was a big moment for for a lot of us, you know, where we suddenly saw that there was something seriously wrong here. And even if it was just a, an administrative error, it was absolute PR disaster. You have to sort of say that, don't you? Um, so, I mean, the other thing is, why is this guy, Tim Kelly, jumping on the back of this news story and uh, going on TV in America and, you know, like, where does he come from? What's his history? Someone needs to look into this and um, 
get some more details of, of why he feels that, why is he in Tyler and, you know, what's his story? He's got a very broad Irish accent, as you can hear. So he's obviously um, someone who spent a lot of time in Ireland. So you you have to wonder, what's what's the story there? There's got to be a story there, isn't there? Anyway, let's go back to the, um, the World Over Live interview and see, I think um, Bishop Strickland said something about that situation now, which you can imagine that there's more to it than just what that guy says, yeah? Single administrative concern that, that I heard, um, he did mention um, a lack of fraternity with my brother bishops, which I, mm. I, I think is basically comes down to a lack of, I'm speaking up and they're not. So that has been, yeah, that's been a bit uncomfortable, but they've been. Okay, so that's a, that breaks my heart, but uh, this is really important, right? And it gets really to the heart of what's going on here. And um, I've got, a, a, like, I'm friends with lots of um, American faithful, American Catholics. And this is one thing that we've often said, it's really interesting that Bishop Strickland speaks out so clearly um, and so few other bishops seem to do that. What is that? Is, you know, what exactly is going on here? Well, there, there has been, um, for, there has been some voices of support, thank God for, um, for Bishop Strickland. Um, but there was, I've seen one voice come out for, in support of him, and that is my old friend, Archbishop Cordiglione. Let me just see if I can bring him up here to show you. There he is. So, you know, I think this was very, like, very brave. And you might think, well, it's a bit sort of piecemeal. Um, but he's, I think, uh, you know, Archbishop Cordiglione has been very wise here. He's, um, very careful to say, let's pray for Pope Francis. So he's working for collegiality and for brotherhood and for the unity of the church. And he's saying, pray for Pope Francis and also pray for Bishop Strickland. So, you know, I thought that was, thanks be to God. But um, but he, I, he, as far as I know, please leave a comment if you've heard different, but as far as I know, he's the only one who's stood up um, for the good bishop so far. So. Anyway, let's see what what he says next. Been very cordial, and I've been at various mm -hmm. meetings and at various events. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, the the fact that I didn't implement uh, traditionis custodis, um, I basically didn't not implement. I just didn't respond. Uh, we have a few Latin masses, and as I mm -hmm. uh, said. I, I felt like I couldn't deprive that portion of the flock of the nourishment they were receiving. Great young families, packed to the gills, these churches where, I mean, we have one FSSP church, so that's accurate. I didn't um, implement that. I think- It's interesting, isn't it? Because I, you know, I have to say, I think his response there is perfectly right. Um, it's interesting that there's not been much follow-up in the UK. Obviously, the the, arch, the cardinal archbishop um, Arthur Roche, who is the prefect for the Congregation of Divine Worship, and the guy who basically implemented it is an old uh, UK bishop. And so, I've been told that he is looking very carefully at what's going on in the UK and ringing up people and saying, ringing up bishops and saying, "Why is that mess going on?" So that's a real shame that that's the case. Um, but I, the, the the stark irony for me is that here we've got a situation where you've got a pope who is um taking the faith of, you know taking the sacraments away from the faithful it just doesn't make any sense to me at all so i you know i think that the bishop's approach there is pretty much the approach of most of the uk bishops to tradition and his custodians i can't really speak for the rest of the world but you, if if it was as much of a problem as Traditionis Custodes made it out to be, then you could see that all the bishops would implement it with great gusto, wouldn't they? And that certainly has not been the case. And, um, you know, going back to that issue, there's loads of my blog about it. If you go to the blog and put in Traditionis Custodes, you'll find all kinds of stats about bishops' responses and how many have implemented it and all that sort of thing. 
and it's you know like it it tells a story all on its own really um and it tells a story as usual of mixed missed priorities you know the pope is going after the wrong things here and these aren't a priority in the church you know faithful catholics who um want to worship jesus in the most reverent way possible in the mass they are not the sort of people that you should be having a go at here so very interesting and uh, you know i think that he did a brilliant job there in in uh just ignore it, <laughs> this custodian. So, okay, what what else? Other bishops have not responded to that as maybe right. the Vatican wishes. So that was one of the issues. Um, yeah, I think the most notable one was Bishop Paprocki, Paprocki um, who is like an eminent canon lawyer. And he basically found a workaround in canon law and he, he wrote an article about it. So again, you can find all that information on my blog, um, but he, you know, he set the pattern, I think, for bishops who were prepared to stand up for those faithful people. Why on earth would you want, why would you want to attack, you know, your own flock? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Certainly my internet media, the social media presence, that is, I'd already been told to, to cool it on that. Um, but I, I feel it's important. I'm you know, I'm a successor of the apostles, and that's a huge responsibility. And I feel the res I do think that the internet is a problem for all of us in lots of, you know, we uh, tend to speak out unwisely without too much thought. And I'm as guilty of that as, as anyone, really. God forgive me. So I, I think um, for a bishop, perhaps, you, you know, you do have to be careful what you put out there. And... Um, you know, I think that you could criticise Bishop Strickland as you could criticise anyone for putting things on Twitter that perhaps weren't as well thought out as they could be. But at the end of the day, if you read through his stuff, it's, it's certainly not outrageous. And one of the big things with Strickland for me is that under any other papacy, he would just be real middle of the road. You know, he certainly wouldn't be in trouble for speaking out for the church, for the magisterium, for the gospel, for Jesus, for the Eucharist, you know, it's absolutely very, very instructive of the situation we find ourselves in, that this guy is not a trad, he's been made out to be far right wing conservative, but he, you know, I've been following him for years and he's not, he's just really bog standard, good Catholic guy. So it's really interesting the things that they've picked out here. Responsibility of speaking the truth, as I understand it, I've tried to do so respectfully. I'm not about attacking anyone. I love the church. I love Christ, his church, the Pope Francis, all the, the I mean, we're all uh, bishops. We're all successors of the apostles. We should be working together. So if, if I'm reading this correctly, it was basically breaking fraternity with your fellow bishops. Bishop, this sounds like Bishop Torres, Daniel Torres down in, in Puerto Rico, who was the sole bishop who objected to vaccines being used. And if memory serves, you also uh, were giving your people an option and said, you don't have to take the vaccine. It may not be morally licit. Is that correct? Okay, so Torres, I mentioned that in my uh, full video on Bishop Strickland, which you can find here on my channel. And I would say, you know, notwithstanding the vaccines thing, that this is the other case, Torres, of someone who Pope Francis just removed because he didn't like what he was saying. Absolutely. I, and, and with the whole COVID situation, um, and that's one of the things that um, wasn't mentioned, but that's where I, I've been on a different page, but I said, we can't mandate people to violate their conscience to, to go against their free will uh, and that's, you know, that was all in the air during the whole COVID situation. Mm. Um, so, you know, there have been many issues that I've been very clear about that I haven't heard the, the clarity on from other bishops. And, you know, it, it, maybe it's the East Texan in me. Maybe it's just, I don't know. But for one thing, Raymond, um, mm. I... I spend a lot of time in prayer. Uh, that's because I need to. I need to grow closer yeah. to the Lord, and I feel that closeness. And when ancient truths 
that Christ proclaimed that are recorded in Scripture that the church has taught for years seem to be up for debate. I've been, I mean, that's one of the things that was listed. I wasn't supportive of the Synod. And, you know, I stand by that. Um, as mm. I said in one of the tweets, I said, why are we discussing things that shouldn't be up for discussion? It's yeah. settled truth that God has revealed to us as far as everything I know. And this development that t is talked about, the church needs to change. Change, yes, to grow closer to the sacred heart of Christ. Yeah. But to change and reverse direction, that's contrary to the development of doctrine, as I understand it. Let me probe. Okay, it's exactly right. And that's, unfortunately, there are a number of things that are being used um, in the, to sort of foister in progress. It's not really progress, is it? It's uh, apostasy. And one of the things is this development of doctrine, which if you watch Catholic Unscripted, we've talked about in, in quite some detail. Um, and the basic principle of St. John Henry Newman is that, um, a, you know, an acorn doesn't develop into a... a into an, an elephant you know so um it the development of doctrine is that doctrine develops to become clearer and and to, so that we can understand it better it doesn't change into something that it's not and so uh, bishop strickland does a great job there of explaining that probe into that question because some outlets have been reported <clears throat> when you met with cardinal pierre uh at the nunciature in washington that he said something to you of the effect of the Holy Father is watching you, and I'm quoting from other periodicals. The Holy Father is watching you. You need to stop talking about the deposit of faith. There is no deposit of faith, end quote. Do you recall an exchange like that? Well, that was from a couple of years ago. And to, to be a little more precise about it, I wouldn't say that... Um, his eminence uh, then, he was archbishop two years ago, but mm -hmm. um, his eminence, uh, Christophe Pierre, basically discounted. Uh, that's the way that I heard it. Discounted the, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, quit emphasizing this deposit of faith so much. It's not what we need to focus on. That is worrying. <laughs> that is really worrying if that's what the nuncio is saying. Um, but this is the guy, remember, you, I've done a video on this as well, who was parroting Pope Francis about um, priests wearing cassocks. So, you know, he's just, he's a yes man. And that's why he's been made a cardinal is because he does what the, what the Pope, exactly what the Pope wants, he implements, um, which I find, personally, I just find uh, terribly depressing. Um, what else have we got here? So this is great, this bit here. Um. There are many bishops still in their see that are corrupted and connected to the McCarrick scandal. This is what is, this is, <laughs> okay. I'm so pleased that he's had the bottle to actually say this, right? And um, because this is what we know if you're, if you're engaged in um, tracking these networks, okay? And there's a lot of work has gone into tracking the money and the networks and this is one of the most worrying things about um, Pope Francis, his election as Pope and the people that he has uh, given preference to and power to since he has been the Pope. And unbelievably, Bishop Strickland puts his finger right on it here. Um, let's just watch the rest of this and I'll show you some more information that you can uh, check, check out on that. That we've never really gotten answers about. And, you know, to me, and it's not about me. It's about Christ and his church. But to have a situation, um, and some people have mentioned names. I'm not going to mention names. But um, there are bishops that are closely. Connected, woven into the McCarrick story. And mm -hmm. there, there's been no action against them. Um, that. That double standard is troubling, but what's more deeply troubling is, as I said five years ago, do we believe what our Catholic faith teaches or not? I said that on the floor of the bishop's meeting five years ago. Mm -hmm. Sadly, the answer that I seem to be getting, not directly, but by circumstance, by 
who people are associating with, but what's going on with the Senate? The answer seems to be no. We don't believe that any mm. longer. Wow. I mean, it's so important, isn't it? When we're talking about the flourishing of the gospel message and the fact that a lot of this just seems to be about political networks, it's really interesting to hear a US bishop speaking out in that way. And he's got a really good point, you know, because um, we know that there are networks of people, networks of bishops. And you can imagine that when you're in such an incredible power, a position of power and influence, it's living in a, a you know really nice mansion or whatever, it's really difficult to stand up and, and contradict or call out the people um, who have put you in that position, isn't it? You can really see that that would be the situation. But um, a lot of work has been done on this. So you can, I'm showing you here, this is a really valuable resource uh, that you can look up. And you can find it basically at, if you look up complicitclergy.com, um, you can find loads of information that shows you the networks that exist. And this is an interactive map. Um, you can see that there's, my carrick is at the center there. And then it shows you all the networks, how everyone is connected. Um, and you, you can see the connections with, say, for example, Joseph Tobin, um, who is, he's the Archbishop of Newark, New Jersey, since 2017. Um, and his connection, his, and who he's connected to, you can see there. Um, Donald Whirl, Wilton Gregory, these are all the people that have been put in to a position of power. Um, Blaise Supich in Chicago is another one. Um, really worrying is this guy, Kevin Farrell. You can see he's, <laughs> he's well connected there. Um, and Farrell is the Camelengo at the moment. Um, and uh, he was originally ordained for... Um, the Legion of Christ, which was a very dodgy um, order um, where the, the, the founder was uh, guilty of all kinds of, of abuse. So they do still exist, um, you know, unbelievably. Um, and so, and he is really high up in the church now. So very interesting connections. Okay, so you can go and check. What I'm trying to say is, is a lot of people have done a lot. Of, this is not just gossip or anyone talking off the top of their head. I'm not just making all this stuff up. All this information is there. Um, what's really interesting is that Bishop Strickland here has broke ranks and he's speaking out about it in a, you know, <laughs> in a really sort of public way. Um, and it's quite extraordinary to see. Um, so, Let's see what else. Let's see what else we can get. The out church of. needs to change. Things need to develop. We don't believe what we used to believe. That I totally disagree. And mm -hmm. that's, I guess, why I'm in the position where I am. There are a lot of lay people and a lot of bishops, I think, uh, certainly whom I've spoken to or encountered in airports on the quiet whispering, who agree with you as well. But they were not certainly speaking with the boldness that you have spoken, uh, Bishop. Let me ask this question. You are in Baltimore. The bishops of the United States are meeting there. Why aren't you at the meeting? Why aren't you present at the meeting? You're still a bishop. Well, I was asked not to attend because of the controversy, and I, I certainly <laughs> respected that. I mean, it's it's a meeting. I mean, I'm not going to beg to go to a meeting. Uh, there's mm. a lot. I mean, it's a lot of work. And a lot of time that's spent with, you know, uh, very often it's it's a whole lot of time and maybe a little bit produced. But, you know, so <laughs> the meeting is not something I was heartbroken to not be at the meeting. OK, so you can understand that. And he has been an outspoken voice uh, constantly at the USCCB meeting. So you can understand why, um, you know, I think it's quite harsh that he's not actually there at the moment. Uh, if you want to catch up on what he has been doing, though, I can certainly help you with that while he's been out there. Um, 
So I wonder if I can just pull up. Need to probably. Uh, all right. Okay, I should have probably planned this before, I should know, but um, it, it's sort of a bit of a pain to keep sharing the screen on and off all the time. So, but I wanted to show you. I might just. So this is my friend, Michael Hitchbourne of the Lepanto Institute. And you can see that he's got here. This Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Amen. 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 So this is what Bishop Strickland was doing at Baltimore, leading people in prayer. Here you've got um, some pictures. There's Bishop Strickland there. Talking, meeting with people. Some people with placards, uh, lots of press, I think, were, public, were around as well. So, and then afterwards, Bishop Strickland led the rosary once again in a private home, about 100 souls in attendance. So, um, there's a great tweet there, look, from Anthony of uh, Avoiding Babylon. Why is it merely imprudent for Francis to take photo ops with new ways or Jimmy, Jimmy Martin, but schismatic and evil for Strickland to read a letter from a friend at a conference? So, this is about the letter. Um, that, that's often being used to sort of have a go at um, Bishop Strickland. <clears throat> uh, anyway, so that's all. <laughs> that's what he's basically been doing in Baltimore. So let's go. Let's go back to um, EWTN and see what else. I, I respected the the request that. I not attend the meeting because it, you know, I, I didn't hear it because, but I presume yeah. because it would have been, and it probably would have been disruptive. I mean, there's work to do, focus on the work. Um, hmm. And I was committed. I mean, you know, I'm sure I'll be criticized for being here in Baltimore, but I had committed to be at a couple of gatherings to pray, like I was at noon mm -hmm. today, to pray a rosary. Yeah. Um, and I said, I'm not going to pull the plug on that because I'm not at the meeting. L let me ask you this. I, I want to take you back for a moment. In June, Pope Francis ordered this apostolic visitation of the diocese. Retired Bishop Gerald Cacanus of Tucson <clears throat> and Bishop Dennis Sullivan of Camden led that investigation. Did they meet with you personally during that visit? What did you make of those visitations, by the way? Well, they, they spent uh, from Monday to Friday meeting with people in the diocese. Uh, I, I really, I didn't want to know. I mean, I didn't want a list of names of who they'd met with. Um, so, I, you know, a few people actually mentioned that they met with them. But they met with me the very last on Saturday morning of that week. I'll always remember it was June 24th, the Nativity of John the Baptist. And... We met for a little over an hour, and they really raised a lot of the issues, the same issues that the, the nuncio raised when we spoke uh, last Thursday. Um, and we had a very cordial, very calm conversation about my life in the diocese. And they really, the administrative issues didn't come up at that meeting. That, that word was really brought out by you know, a priest in the diocese who said, oh, there have been administrative issues. Yeah, five. Okay, so that's what we're, that's the video that I played you earlier on. I think that's who he's referring to. Years ago, yeah, I made some major changes because I saw mm. that the direction things were going uh, weren't according to my wishes. And, and I saw that mm. things were happening that I disagreed with, and I'm the bishop. So I stepped in and said, we need to make some changes. That was. So that is what a bishop does, isn't it? And it's it sounds like sour grapes from this other priest. Watch Robert Nugent's video because that is really work like gives you the background on that. If you're interested in that particular dynamic, I would say watch Robert's video and that will give you a different perspective. Five years ago, it's been pretty stable since we we surpassed our our goal and hit a record for the bishop's appeal. That's the bishop's fundraising 
for the diocese mm -hmm. for 2023, over 3 million in pledges. Um, that was a record. We've got 20 seminarians, fine young men. Uh, we've had a couple of priests that have been welcomed in the diocese over the past couple of years. So the administrative issues, it's like there's no there there, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I mean, I've got a, a good team there, very stable. Uh, yeah, there have been some bumps in the road in 10 years, but nothing that, I mean, we're not going bankrupt. Bishop, they keep trying to spin this as somehow this is mismanagement of the diocese. And I keep asking publicly, I'll ask today, where are the findings? Where is the the evidence of this? You know, a canonist told uh, the, our Sunday visitor, the fall. Okay, so he's, he's going to move on now to, uh, Raymond takes this immediately to sort of, an, an, another angle, but I think that is really important. The fact of the matter is that Tyler is a successful diocese and it's successful. It's got vocations. It's financially supported by its faithful. And the reason for those things, guys, is because Bishop Strickland is a faithful bishop and he is loved by his people. And if you've, if you've got a bishop that you trust and you love, then if he asks you for money, if he asks you for prayers, if he asks you for help, then you're there to give it to him. And they can't, you know, like the vocations speak for themselves. All right, 20 seminaries doesn't sound like a lot, but Tyler is quite a small diocese. And pro rata, it's way, way above a much bigger diocese in the USA. And the USA, you know, I think they've got good vocations in a lot of dioceses. But the point is that a lot of people are gravitating to Tyler because of Bishop Strickland. So it just does your head in that they've done what they've done. It doesn't make, it's not working for the faith. You know, this is this is my question with it all. I find it extremely unsettling. Um, if like, I'm absolutely fine if they could show us that he'd done something, uh, that there was some malfeasance. But like here you see again, like no one can point to any and even Mike, you know, on, on where Peter is, he's saying, oh, he didn't implement traditionis custodes or whatever. You know, big deal. He's, you know, like you've got this situation where Pope Francis is endorsing Sister Janine Gramic, who, um, you know, is head of New Ways Ministry and uh, who actually teaches that church teaching is wrong. So you've got the Pope doing all these kind of weird things, meeting with James Martin, who is someone who's campaigning for a change in, in church teaching. Um, giving us all the wrong, and this is a guy who is speaking out for Jesus, for the church, for the Eucharist, for the sacraments, and he's getting smashed down for it. Bad, bad, bad play, if you ask me. You know, this guy really needs our prayers and, you know, he really needs our support. So please do keep him in your prayers. Following, I'll put this up. Uh, he says this removal was administrative. The removal does not of itself entail any wrongdoing. It's just a pastoral judgment that the ministry has become detrimental or ineffective in that particular place. That's Father John Beale, a professor of canon law at CUA. Your response, and did the Holy See communicate that you had mismanaged the diocese to you? No, and uh, I mean... John Beale was one of my professors when I studied canon law. He's a good man. But, uh, you know, to I think to administratively remove a bishop just because, I mean, the pope doesn't like how you're administering the diocese. Um, that's pretty serious. And, and I think I encouraged some of the bishops that I have spoken to 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 really look at the question. It's, it's not about me. It's done. Um, but for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's pretty arbitrary. Uh, it's pretty... And it's unprecedented. That's the most amazing thing, is that there's only Bishop Torres in Puerto Rico, and that's twice that this has happened. I mean, other bishops are removed, but they're removed for a reason. And Bishop Strickland has been removed because Pope Francis disagrees with some of the things he said. What, where is all this talk of... OK, first of all, Pope Francis has gone on about parousia, this word this Greek word, which means strong argument, um, that he, li he said in an interview very early on in this paper, so he likes criticism. He really appreciates it because it's the only way, and I think it, that was a great thing. This is the thing, right? 
you know, I don't disagree with everything Pope Francis says, but I, but there is a clear disconnection between what he says and what he does. And here we see it here. This is, you know, like Bishop Strickland has always been careful to say that um, he prays for the Pope and he loves the Pope, but it's the Pope's actions that he criticises. That is completely legitimate to say, and, and, you know, in the spirit of parousia, you think Pope Francis would ring him up and say, how can we sort this out, mate? Like, surely that would be good management in any sort of situation. Instead, what does he do? He doesn't even talk to him. He just cuts him off. He takes him out of... And it's a raw exercise of power. It's the act of a dictator. And dictators, what do dictators make? They make martyrs. It would be interesting to see what happens. You can see that Bishop Strickland is quite a humble, simple guy. And it will be interesting to see what happens. But I would imagine he will be in great demand now by faithful Catholics to go around um, the country, to go around the USA and probably wider abroad to say, you know, to speak the truth and to encourage people to follow the gospel and not to get um, downhearted, which so many Catholics are, by the constant contradictions of the faith that uh, are coming out of Rome, etc. So it would be interesting to see what happens. But basically, Pope, Fra Pope Francis' dictatorial actions may just have made Bishop Strickland, the most powerful martyr in the church today. We'll have to wait and see. Much just, and the, the Holy Father has that authority, but to, to exercise it in that way, I don't think it's the best thing for the church. Um, you know, I'm sure there are people in the Diocese of Tyler that are relieved that this outspoken bishop is gone. There are some that are very sad there are probably some that are just, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, who's the next bishop? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to stay committed to Jesus Christ Thanks and the deposit of faith that is the treasure that we have. It's good news. I'm truth. not going to, to say, let's go the, down the senatorial path and change everything because there's some things that don't change. That's the solidity of our Catholic tradition. And yeah. nobody's going to tell me it's changed. It, it, it's but, like Bishop, reality doesn't change. Mm. Bishop, have you asked for a private audience with Pope Francis to address this decision, to address any personal concerns he might have had with your running the former diocese now? Good luck and will, or will you ask for such a meeting? No. I have no plans to. Um, that may be something that I discern is, is the right thing to do. But the Holy Father has made this decision. Um, clearly, we disagree on some things. Um, and, you know, I just, as I've said, if, if I'm going contrary to the catechism and to the Catholic faith, to the deposit mm -hmm. of faith that we've inherited, Please tell me, but I've heard no message like that. I want to be corrected if I'm incorrect, but honestly, Raymond, I feel like it. See, I think that's a sign of humility and the fact that how are you supposed to operate in any role just completely in isolation? Um, it does seem like Bishop Strickland has been isolated. And I've spoken to my American friends about this before, that he does seem to be out of the loop in terms of um, the American bishops, and, and that uh, you can't help but feel that is because so many of them are in a little club um, that we're not allowed to know about. Would be less than respectful to the decision that the Holy Father has made. To it, it, it basically is without appeal, and so to give the appearance that I was making an appeal personally, um, you know, I may reach that point, but that's not yeah. in the plans for moving forward for me. I really don't know what the plans are. People have asked me, what are you going to do? I'm going to be faithful to Christ. I'm still going to do my best to be a successor of the apostles. But what that looks like in the future, I don't know. But I, d I don't believe I can just go quietly into the dark night. I mean, I've got mm -hmm. to share the light of Christ in a world that yeah. needs his truth so desperately. Finally, Your Excellency, it has been suggested 
that in the past you had concerns about the governance of Pope Francis. And in May, you tweeted the following that garnered much controversy. It was this. Please allow me to clarify regarding Patrick Coffin has challenged the authenticity of Pope Francis. If this is accurate, I disagree. I believe Pope Francis is the pope, but it is time for me to say that I reject his program of undermining that deposit of faith, follow Jesus. That is the quote from uh, May of 2023. Might that have been where the deposit of faith conversation originated with the nuncio? Well, I think that's certainly a part of it. Um, and really, frankly, Raymond, the simple answer that I can give, two years ago, the Vatican, one of the offices, clearly said in relation to the you know, same-sex unions and all of that controversy, the Vatican said, we cannot bless sin. And now, two years later, mm. well, it, we think that's up for debate. No, it's not. Mm. And that's what I mean. That's part of the deposit of faith. That is serving the people of God. That's being a, a successor of the apostles to tell people, this is sinful, repent and return to the path of Christ. And if you can't do that as a bishop, what's the point of being a bishop? If you can't give clarity to people, and this is why a lot of this discussion is so problematic, there is this, the, the, the job of discussion and debate, and that's all allowed in the churches, but in a proper forum. For it all to be going on at the highest levels, it just makes it look like these people don't believe in the faith. And as Bishop Strickland said, it appears to us faithful that many of the bishops don't have any faith. When we have given up our lives, you know, a lot of us for the faith, um, we've committed our families and our children through great personal struggle, you know. Imagine what it's like for someone who's same-sex attracted, who has been careful with their actions and repentant, and is trying to live by what the church teaches, to then be told that all of that is doesn't matter and that they could have been doing whatever they wanted all the time, you know, and it wouldn't make any difference um, to their eternal salvation or to the way that they live their lives, it's perfectly valid. How incredibly insulting and painful must that be if you've um, gone through all of that struggle? So Bishop Strickland is completely on the right path. You know, that's all I can say. To say, hmm. oh, well, we don't, we're not sure it's sinful anymore. I do disagree. And I feel obligated before the Lord, before Jesus no. Christ, to say, no, no well, that's not what he yeah, told well, this, us. <laughs> yeah, for the average Catholic, whether it's reality or perceived, it feels like it's a whiplash magisterium where what was right last week is now wrong and what was wrong last week is now totally acceptable. And people are just confused. It lends confusion. Uh, I have to ask you this, at a conference in Rome recently, you read a, a, a letter from, I, I believe you described it as a faithful uh, Catholic on Facebook. Did you know you were going to be relieved of your position? When okay, so I mentioned this earlier. This is probably the most controversial thing that Bishop Strickland has done. And, uh, you know, if, if I was counseling him, I would have counseled him not to do it, but... And you read that Facebook post and it contended, suggested that the Pope m may not be legitimate. Do you accept that the Pope is legitimate? Why did you read the letter? I read the letter and, you know, I mean, you, how you read things, but I presented that letter. It was presented to me there was a lot of challenge to me personally in that letter. If you read the whole thing, it's saying, mm -hmm. Bishop, do you want to guard the truth or just keep your job? Um, that was basically mm -hmm. the challenge. And mm -hmm. so the way I read it, it, it used the word usurper, which is very strong. But what mm -hmm. I understood from that letter was that it was saying, and what I was being told is the Pope is using the authority of the chair of Peter to change what Christ has said. And to me, that that's the nuance that I had. I didn't read it as saying, because like I said, I believe that Pope Francis is the Pope. I mean, there's been no clear statement. I mean, if he's not the Pope, who is? <laughs> um, mm. He is the Pope. 
Uh, but it's a yeah, and I think I, you know, I have to go, that's exactly the right position to take. You know, it's way beyond our <clears throat> um, authority to pronounce on who the Pope. You know, if the, what a terrible position to be in. This is the first time in history, I think, where um, you know. Is the Pope Catholic? It is not a, a foregone conclusion. It's not a, a, a term of rhetoric, so um, it's a difficult thing. But yeah, definitely the Pope. You know, it was the Pope is the Pope until if the Cardinal said that he wasn't the Pope, then that would be something different. But you know, we've just got a bad Pope, and we've just got to, I think pray for him, and at the same time keep the faith. And that's basically the mission, the, the message of Bishop Strickland. We'll only have this Pope for a little bit of time, and then. You know, we'll move on to something else. So, like, let's not get hung up on personalities. Let's. The only personality is that we should get hung up on is that of Jesus. It's a tragic thing for me to say. I seriously disagree with some of the things that the Holy Father, the man who holds the Petron office in this year, 2023, things that he's saying, and the people that surround him. And I've, I've tried to say that as well, that mm. certainly the Pope has said confusing things, but a lot of the people that he has appointed as cardinals, the people in the various offices of the Vatican, they haven't said confusing things. They've said things that contradict the deposit of faith. And the Pope has put them in place. So it really, it frustrates me. If he disagrees with what they're saying, He's the Pope. He can clear it up very quickly, very simply, and say, mm. this is what we believe as Catholics. I pray that he will do that. Your Excellency, Bishop Joseph Strickland, we will leave it there. I thank you for the time. Okay, so there you go. That's the full interview. I think it's really worth watching because it gives you an idea of, um, you know, what a lovely we will guy Bishop Strickland is, I think. So, uh Okay, so I was going to go on with some other stuff, but uh, I think this video has been um, long enough. Thank you very much for your patience. If you've got any questions, do put them down below and uh, we'll try and answer them as best I can. Um, I wanted to get something up today, so I hope you don't mind and, um, that I've, I'm here in St. Peter's Basilica, which obviously is a lovely <laughs> place to be. Um, God bless you all. Please pray for Bishop Strickland and pray, pray for the church.